Dear all, uh, today the College is uh, presenting three very important documents, all related to the most pressing challenges the European Union as a whole faces today – security, migration and Ukraine. Let me start by telling that uh, fragmentation makes us vulnerable. In all of these areas, what the Commission is uh, working towards is to introduce more coordination, more solidarity and more unity. Because it is only together that we will overcome the challenges we collectively face. On security union. Firstly, on security, you heard uh, recently President Juncker say in this very same place, in this room, that in the wake of the attacks that have shook Brussels, Madrid, London, Copenhagen and Paris, it is time Europe to move towards a genuine security union. Member States are responsible for ensuring the security of their citizens. That is clear. But it is equally clear that the transnational threats Europe faces today go beyond national security. The internal security of one member state is the internal security of the whole Union. As I said, fragmentation makes us vulnerable. Fragmentation in uh, legal instruments, in uh, operational methods and in mindsets prevents us from dealing with terrorism in an effective way. And so we need a step change, a change in the mentality of national authorities, of security forces, right down to the last police officer who should have the same reflex to share relevant information with colleagues over the border, as he would do with uh, fellow officers within the country. Today, the Commission is setting out a roadmap towards a security union, building further on the European agenda of security. I present almost exactly one year ago, as you remember, in this very same place. This is about connected all the dots. A lot has happened in the past year, and we have to draw lessons from that. In the past 12 months, we advanced on several actions announced in the European Agenda on Security. Some legislative initiatives are still under discussion in the European Parliament and in the Council. One example of this is PNR, the Passenger's Name Record. I am grateful that after an overwhelming majority in the European Parliament approved the EU PNR Directive, the Council will formally adapt it tomorrow. Another is Europe's Counter-Terrorism Centre, which was launched, as you remember, in January. And by autumn, we will bring forward initiatives to strengthen the work of Europol and to upgrade this centre. This is good progress, but there are other elements, uh, key information sharing tools and legislation at European level, that are not progressing fast enough. The Commission's ambitious proposals on criminalising and sanctioning terrorism and on, reg uh, on regulating firearms, for example, are still on the table. Other proposals, like the proposal on explosives, have been adopted but not implemented. In the meantime, we continue our work on radicalization too. Yes, prevention is key, and we will continue all our efforts and on social inclusion. Also there. But uh, a security-focused approach is also essential to consistently monitor those who are identified 
as radicalized individuals and to share this information with other member states and EU agencies. It is time to redouble our efforts. European Union member states continue to suffer from gaps in information sharing. Our whole approach on information sharing needs structural rethinking. I'm not going to get into details now, as I already presented our ideas on interoperability two weeks ago. But let me, however, repeat this. Without information sharing, we are fighting ter terrorism in national silos. It is absolutely critical that we deepen trust. All these examples show the need for a culture change in law enforcement and counterterrorism. We need to move towards a genuine and effective security union. But our approach should not only be inward looking. We have to continue working with key third countries, such as Turkey and the Western Balkans, in fighting the threat of terrorism at a more global level. Tomorrow, at the Justice and Home Affairs Council meeting in Luxembourg, I will present these ideas and discuss with Member States and the Ministers how can we best work together to achieve a genuine security union. And now we come to migration. Here too, fragmentation is what makes us vulnerable as well. The European Union will only effectively address the refugee crisis by working in concert with each other and with our third country partners like Turkey. We saw that the unity emerged when 28 EU heads of states or governments collectively reached an agreement with Turkey to break the cruel business pattern of smugglers. By ending the irregular migration from Turkey into the European Union and replacing it instead with legal channels of resettlement of refugees to the European Union. Today, the Commission published the first report on the implementation of the EU-Turkey agreement, and I am pleased to say that progress has been made to operationalize the statement. This has been, and continues to be, a joint effort and challenge of the Greek and Turkish authorities, the Commission, member states and EU agencies, as well as international organizations and NGOs. <clears throat> we have already seen a sharp drop in the number of people crossing irregularly the Aegean Sea from Turkey into Greece, which means that the activities of smugglers in the, in the area have been hit. As you all know, return operations have started from the Greek islands to Turkey, in parallel with the resettlement flights directly from Turkey to European Union's member states. Greek authorities have put in place all the necessary legal and operational arrangements. Turkey has provided the necessary legal assurances for Syrians, and we are in close contact with the Turkish authorities to make sure that guarantees are there for non-Syrians who need protection as well. EASO and Frontex are already providing substantial additional support to the Greek authorities in the islands. We have stepped up implementation of the facility for refugees in Turkey to improve conditions for refugees in this country. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that we are still at the beginning of the work. Improving the conditions for migrants in the facilities in the islands is a top priority for the Commission, and we are working together with the Greek authorities to this end. The Commission already awarded 30 million euros to the Greek armed forces to improve conditions, and yesterday the Commission offered 
83 million under the new emergency assistance instrument that will go to NGOs working to improve living conditions for refugees in Greece. Allow me to say here that NGOs and international organizations need to be our partners in these efforts. We all want the same thing. Another crucial element is stepping up relocations. Today, 56 persons were relocated from Greece to France and 42 persons from Greece to the Netherlands. But we need to see their numbers increase to reach an average of 6,000 per month, as I have repeatedly said before. Around 70 percent of the more than 50,000 people currently in Greece are eligible for relocation. Greece needs to step up efforts to improve conditions in Greece. Member States need to help by stepping up relocation and resettlement efforts. Further efforts are also required from Turkey. Turkey notably needs to take the necessary measures to fulfill the remaining benchmarks of the visa liberalization roadmap by the end of April, with a view to lifting the visa requirements for Turkish nationals at the latest by the end of June 2016. President Juncker was crystal clear yesterday, and as I as I been in, in the past, no visa liberalization can be offered if not all benchmarks are met. The Commission will present its third visa liberalization progress report for Turkey on May the 4th. All in all, we need to remain alert and monitor the entire process closely, particularly when it comes to ensuring rights and appropriate conditions for the most vulnerable, such as women and children. The Commission <clears throat> remains committed to ensuring that the implementation of all elements happens in full accordance with EU and international law. And now, about Ukraine. I would like to inform you about an important development related to Ukraine. Because here, too, fragmentation is what makes Europe vulnerable. Here, too, we need to remain united and stand by our neighbor and partner Ukraine as Ukraine continues on the path of reforms. I am pleased to announce that today the Commission issued a legislative proposal to put Ukraine on the list of visa-free countries in the visa regulation. In other words, we are implementing our commitment to propose visa-free travel to the EU for Ukrainian citizens with biometric passports, which we announced in December in the final report on the country's visa liberalization action plan. Our decision is also, to, is also a recognition of the efforts made by the Ukrainian government in meeting all the benchmarks and achieving far-reaching and difficult reforms in the justice and home affairs area and beyond. The proposal now will be transmitted to the Council and to the European Parliament for discussion and adoption. I sincerely hope that visa-free travel for Ukrainian citizens to the European Union will become a reality very soon. Thank you very much for your attention.